<clears throat> Ezekiel 37. Um, Ezekiel 37. Robert's been through the um, the call to evangelize. And, and in large part today, I'm going to piggyback off of, of what he's already kind of established out of um, Romans chapter 10 and, and give us a foundation as we look forward to what salvation is. We've already talked about over the last several weeks that Christ came. There was always a plan to save sinners. Christ came to die on the cross to save sinners and that, that his dying on the cross was necessary that his blood be spilt for sinners to be covered by the blood of Jesus, to be righteous in Christ. And I want us to get a picture now of, of what that looks like as we are converted and, and brought into the family of God. <coughs> so this is kind of a, a, a precursor to that, really. Verse 1 of Ezekiel 37. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now just to be clear, this is a vision that Ezekiel is receiving, being caught up by the Spirit of God. And so when, when God is speaking, he is speaking to Ezekiel. Okay? When he says, Son of man, can these bones live? When he says in verse 4, and or he says in at the half part, way part of verse 3, and I answered, Ezekiel was answering, right? He says, and I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, verse 4, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and said to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and that you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, sinews were on them and flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, the Lord Yahweh is what it says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Let's pray. God, give Help to us this morning. Though we are small in number, we know that you are large in grace and much in kindness. And so I ask that for all of us that are here, um, that you would please bless for all that hear this message, Lord. Please bless that you would draw us near to yourself, that you would help us have a right understanding of how you work in salvation and how you call men to yourself. God, thank you that you give grace. Thank you that you are kind to save sinners. Please, please save sinners in this town. Please, please save sinners in our community, Father. Bring people to Christ here. And Lord, let us be faithful to continually proclaim this gospel, this good news of Christ Jesus himself. Let us believe with all of our hearts that you are the one who saves and that you can and that you will. Help us have a right view of how you work, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're working through, of course, having a right view of salvation. Having a right view of salvation. And we've, again, looked at the cross. We looked at God's plan from the very beginning. The foreshadowing of the cross of Christ. And then we've talked about the atoning work of Christ on the cross. That his blood must cover sin. His blood must atone. Or else we are still dead in our trespasses. Now, we know though when Christ died on the cross that his blood wasn't immediately applied to sinners, right? His blood wasn't applied to sinners. And this is kind of confusing language, but I want us to understand this. Because when Christ died on the cross, if his blood was spilt, 
it doesn't mean that then, at that moment, every single sinner was part of the family of God now. Now, we are elected to that, foreknown to that, but not applied to our lives yet. Because apart from God, we are what? Apart from Christ Jesus, we are still abiding under the wrath of God. Because there's only two things you can abide under. Either you are under the wrath of God, or you are under the love and the kindness and the mercies of God. That's it. There's no middle ground. There's no being in both camps. You're either one or the other. And before Christ, we are under the wrath of God. The blood has not been applied to us in salvation. But how, how are we saved? How are we converted? How are we brought into the family of God? And this is what we're really going to focus on these next several weeks. About what it looks like in, in the um, order of salvation, if you will. Of, of how God works these things out. Obviously, we're saved through the blood of Jesus, but how are we converted? How are we brought to God? Because it's not just that he died on the cross and now we're all saved. If that were the case, we would just not evangelize. We're all good, right? That's not the case. The blood is applied, and we know what salvation is. We've talked about faith and repentance, and, and in a few weeks we will detail that, what faith really means and what repentance really is. But for now, we have to see what comes before faith and repentance. We must realize that salvation is all of God. Salvation is all of God. And God has to be doing work before, even before we believe, even re before we repent. Okay? And, and Robert's already mentioned some of these things this morning in our, in our discipleship time. And, and really, we're going to build on that because it was so true. Now... What's the truth? We, we've walked through the, the right view of God, the right view of man, and now, or we've spent time walking through what it looks like as, as far as us being depraved in our sin. That we were dead in trespasses and sins. I want to read to you again. We've read this before. We'll read it again, I'm sure. This is Ephesians chapter 2, the first three verses of chapter 2. Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So we've worked through these principles. We've worked through these truths of Scripture that apart from God, we are in sin. But what does that mean exactly as far as our relationship with God? Well, it means that we don't have a relationship with God apart from Christ. It means, actually, that we can't even have a relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ, right? No one else. There is no other name by which we can be saved other than Christ. He must bridge the gap. And the issue here is not only that we can't, that we can't get to God without Christ, we also can't do that on our own. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. Do you think Paul means this in a physical way? Or in a spiritual way? Well, of course, he obviously means this in a spiritual way. So, spiritually speaking, God must do the work. Because we are still dead in our sins. Apart from Christ, we are dead. So, go back to Ezekiel 37. The reason why we're in Ezekiel 37 is because Ezekiel 37 gives us a picture of what it looks like when God speaks to men. Okay, this is a picture of... Really, the, in, a, in a way of, of God saying this is, this is how men are brought to him. Now, Ezekiel 37, and this is kind of dangerous for us to do if we're not careful. We could go to Old Testament passages and say, well, this Old Testament passage is clearly about me and about my stuff going on. When that's hardly ever the case. But what we can say in Ezekiel 37 is that there is application to salvation. There is application to what God does when he brings sinners to repentance and faith in Christ. And we'll see that this morning. There is an application here. It's actually in chapter 36 and 37 where God is proclaiming to Israel that I'm going to make you new. This is right in the middle of Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel is kind of in this time frame where the people of Israel have been captured Many people in Judah have been deported and all these different things. And Ezekiel is proclaiming that a couple of things are going to happen. God is going to change you. And he's not just going to bring you back to this place. He's actually going to change who you are. 
And so there is a direction here. There is direction here um, and clarity to Israel, right? This is purposely pointed to Israel. Because eventually, many of these people dispersed would come back to Israel. So there's an application there directly. But there's also an application or a picture of God's work in the new covenant. This picture is repeated and clarified in the New Testament. So think about Ephesians 2. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. So we we read through the passage of Ezekiel 37 where God calls Ezekiel to look out into a valley of dry, dead bones. Again, we're seeing that picture in the New Covenant. We're seeing the picture when Paul is telling the Ephesians, we're the same way. Spiritually speaking, we are dead. This is also a picture of when Lazarus was dead and Jesus came to Lazarus and called forth Lazarus out of the grave even several days after he had been killed. This picture is consistent in the scriptures that God has to be the one who works. God has to be the one that causes spiritual life. So before we can even get into what faith looks like, before we can even really get into faith and repentance and someone coming to faith in Christ, that they were at one time apart from God, but now are born again. Before we even look at that, we must come to the realization and the fact of Scripture that God must do the work. It's not a work that we can do because, again, we are spiritually dead. Ezekiel 37 speaks of this. Even Ezekiel 36 is a a similar picture. If you go down to verse 26 of Ezekiel 36, he's speaking of Israel saying, I'm going to take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He says, I will give them a new heart, put a new spirit within them. What's the implication? Their hearts are stone. They have a hard heart. Now, all of these things have a direct application to what God is going to do to the people of Israel then. But I think even more so is is a picture of what God is going to do in the new covenant to the true and new Israel, those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ. So again, men are spiritually dead, right? Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37, we're spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, we're dead in trespasses and sins. Colossians 2 says something similar in verse 13. It says... When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So Paul is making this statement and the New Testament is making this proclamation repeatedly. And this is repeated throughout scripture. That God, because of our sin, God is separate from us and we are separate from God. We're dead. And dead men... Do not seek for God. Dead men do not make moves toward God. Dead men can't decide to make a spiritual direction toward God. And this is, we have to get this. Or we are going to be thinking that somehow salvation is something we have to do. That we have to fix it or we have to make something right. Because every other relationship and every other framework that we have in our world seems to suggest that it's dependent upon us to do something. And the proclamation of Scripture over and over and over again is that you can't. So if we're dead, what does that mean? All the implications of being dead. That we're not alive. If I go to a cemetery and I do the same thing that Ezekiel is called to do in this vision, and I just proclaim, every one of you, wake up. Will they listen? Can they even hear? Do they even know they're dead? No. No. And dead men can't do anything. So sometimes we get carried away in in, um, churches and in evangelicalism and preaching particularly where we act as though people's salvation depends on what we do. That we have to do the right things. Again, we have to make sure that we do the right things to get the people in because we got to get them saved. And that's our responsibility. We have to save people essentially is the way we act by the ways the ways in which we do things. But the scripture is saying the exact opposite. That men can't decide to come toward God. And as we read in Romans 3 several weeks ago and several times, men don't even seek for God. 
Men don't look and say, I need to go, I need to go find God. I need to go find God. They don't do that unless God himself works in them. See, we are much like Abram, before Abraham, right? That he was just doing his thing, living in paganism. God has to come and grab a hold of us. God has to come and wake us up. God has to come and snatch us up out of the clay and put our feet on the rock. He has to do these things because we're unable to do them ourselves. In fact, if we're dead in trespasses and sins, which is a spiritual reality, then we're spiritually unable and unwilling to come to God. We're spiritually unable and unwilling to come to God. Now, you might be looking at this this through the lens of what we see in the world around us. And what we see is that if we go and present a nice gospel message, it might be really watered down or whatever, and we tell people very generic truths, that people are like, okay, yeah, I want to buy into that. But the reality that we have to look through is the gospel itself, the Bible itself. We can't be captured by what we see and think, well, I really feel like these people are really understanding or really seeking. What does the Bible say? The Bible says we don't do that, that we don't seek, that we're unable, again, to come to God and unwilling. See, we who are dead spiritually can't spiritually make a move to God. A physically dead man can't make a move toward life. And a spiritually dead man can't make a move toward life. And we're not partly spiritually dead, by the way. You can't be halfway in or halfway out. You're either dead in your trespasses or you're alive. There's no middle ground. So you can't be, well, they're kind of dead. I've heard people um, actually make this proclamation that God has given us this provenient grace, right? He has kind of made it where we're neutral a little bit, right? We're we're in sin, but he's given us a capacity to figure it out as ourselves. But the Bible is very clear that that's not the case. And it's given these pictures over and over again that we are dead. Pictures that we're dead, and then it gives the actual direction that we're dead in trespasses and sins. So we can't do anything. We are, spiritually speaking, like a corpse. Nothing there. There's absolutely no hope. Even when men seem to make a move toward God, if it's not based upon the direction of the Spirit and the drawing in of Christ, all it is is seeking something other than actuality in God, other than than actual salvation in Christ. So think about the rich young ruler. You might at first notice, if this happened in in our culture or in our world, we would think, well, this guy, maybe he is genuine. He does all these religious things, right? He has lived this responsible life. He's kept the law of God. He's moral. And then he comes to Jesus and says, I've done all these things. I've kept your commands. And Jesus says, fine, we'll give all this, your stuff away. And it says the man went away sad, right? It says the man went away sad because he had many possessions. So even in his coming, it seems like if you were on, at first glance, you would think, well, Christ rejected him. But is that what happened? Did Christ reject this man? No. Christ didn't reject him. He said, I don't really want you. I don't really want Christ. I want my stuff. And even when he seemed like he made an inclination towards God, it was really only to get what Jesus offered. He really loved his stuff and kind of wanted some of what Jesus had. He could just add it to his collection. It might not be a physical wealth, but it was something there that he could add to his collection of stuff. People often come to God in this way. People often come to God seeking something from God, but not God himself. We spent um, our time in our study last last year, I guess, last spring, going through that Behold Your God study. And the first lesson is on the fact that God must be the attraction, that he must be the thing that we're here to learn about and, and to meet and to be with. Like, it's not about all the blessings, right? Um, When we give gifts, we don't think, I really want you to worship the gift that I give you. I want you to love me. That's the whole point, right? And God doesn't give spiritual blessings or physical blessings even, for that matter, or even eternal blessings for the sake of us falling in love and idolizing the blessings. Because we know that God is the reason why you have family, right? He's the only one that can do that. He created life, and he created the people around you. But God did not give you and I each other for us to worship each other. That would be foolish. 
But many people come in, come into God want those things, want the blessings, want the actual gifts because they value the gifts more than the giver. <clears throat> so people can come to God all the time for ulterior, out of ulterior motives. Even when men seem to come the, for the right way, sometimes they just want freedom from guilt. I feel guilty over sin. Who can alleviate the guilt? Well, if Jesus might can alleviate the guilt. Then I'll go out and live my life the way I want, and then I don't feel so guilty. Think about that's the kind of the dichotomy that Catholics have. Catholics live with this kind of this framework here of, well, we're guilty, so I need to go to the priest. He's going to tell me I'm forgiven, and then I feel good again. And then I go out and do whatever I want. And then next week I'll go back to the priest, and he can kind of forgive those things. And I won't feel guilty. So the idea is that God can give me, through the priest in that, in that framework, he can give me this forgiveness, this guilt-free life. And then that becomes their God, not being guilty. And essentially, their God is themselves still. They've not given up anything. They've not been born again. They're still only seeking what benefits them and not what glorifies God. Unless God is in it, men really only want assurance. Listen to this. Often, men do not really want salvation in Christ. They only want assurance of salvation. Think about that. Think about how the so many people in our lives, whether in ministry that y'all been a part of or churches you've been a part of, they don't come to God for salvation. Oftentimes it's they come to him for assurance of salvation. And they want someone to tell them that they're fine. I remember seeking for that as a kid, thinking, I don't know about salvation. I just want assurance of salvation. I wasn't really interested in God. I just wanted somebody to tell me that I was good to go. That I was fine. How many of you have felt like that? You probably have, right? That you just wanted a piece of paper just to say, I'm going to heaven. That's all I cared about as a kid. I didn't really care about God. I cared about the paper. I cared about the guarantee. I cared about somebody saying, dude, I know you're in. You're good to go. And I, when I was 17, I actually had a preacher tell me that, essentially. He said, I don't think, I was kind of struggling with salvation stuff. And he said, I don't think, I don't think you have anything to worry about. I think you're a Christian. But maybe it's something else that's going on in your life. Well, as a side note, we don't really get to say who's in heaven or who's not in heaven or who's a Christian or who's not a Christian. Right? Now, there are people that we see that we'll say, we'll say that. We'll say, this is my brother in Christ. Well, why? Why do we say that? Because every evidence that we know of would proclaim that they're in Christ. But only God knows. Right? Only God really knows the heart. Likewise, we can say, well, my cousin or my friend or my neighbor is not a Christian. And we can have pretty good evidence that they're not. Um, and, and, but we don't know souls. I mean, we can obviously look at somebody and say, okay, well, if they say they're not a Christian, that's pretty good evidence that they're not a believer. We don't know what God's doing in people's lives. God might be working in people and, and, and bringing people to himself. You know, we have children that are wrestling through things. But we don't say all of a sudden when they say, hey, I want to become a Christian, we don't say, you've done it. You're here. I can make that proclamation for you. You're saved. Well, no, we can't because only God does this work. We don't, want, we don't want men to come just for the sake of assurance. But that's often what people do. That's often what people do. Men are spiritually dead. And there should be, kind of similar to when we walk through depravity and our own, and our own sinfulness and our own wretchedness and our own wickedness, there should be a level of, of, of disparity when we look at that or, or desperation we say we can't do it because you, we can't come to God nobody decides one day you know what I'm a wreck I'll just go back to Jesus the prodigal son only returns by a work of God himself people aren't just living out there going you know what I'm just going to do it I'm going to make a decision today and we, we kind of make proclamations about salvation that way don't we use that language? Hey, we need to make a decision for Christ. And we use it that, in that way. Has the Bible ever said anything about making decisions for Christ? No. It says repent and believe the gospel, right? Trust in Christ. Run to him. And certainly there is a responsibility for us. And to an extent it is a decision, right? But that's not where we're at when we're spiritually dead. We don't just decide one day, okay, I'll take salvation. 
I think we view salvation as a picture. Like God has this gift and he has put it down on earth and he says, all right, take it if you want. If you don't, that's okay. I'll just take whatever's left back home. You know, like it's a candy jar at the doctor's office. You take it, you're good. If not, that's okay. But, you know, you're not part of the kingdom. That's not what salvation is. God doesn't just hope that people come to Christ. He doesn't just hope that his gift will get out there. He knows that if he gave the gift of eternal life and he set it down before men, what we see in Romans 3, that he could, he could call out to every single person, all the billions of people who are alive and who have ever existed and whoever will exist, he could look at them and say, any, does any one of you want salvation? And Romans 3 says no one will take him up on that. Not one of us will say, I do. We will all say, I would rather do my thing. I'd rather be in my sins because that's what I love. Only God can work it in the hearts of men to be alive. We can't make ourselves alive. Now there is hope in this. There is hope in this. That if we're dead in our trespasses and sins, and we really are, well, then that means that only a work of God can do it. Only a work of God can actually bring us to himself. So I don't have to rely on myself. I don't have to rely on, especially from the sense of preaching the gospel, I don't have to be a better preacher, right? I mean, hopefully, we're always trying to be better at what we're doing. So, right, if we do music, we want to do that well. If we preach, we want to preach well for God's glory. But it's not dependent upon me to use persuasive speech and better language. Paul talked about that in Corinthians. So it's not our jobs to do that. But there is a hope. So if we're in verse, or let's go back to uh, Ezekiel 37. It says, And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. So again, we're all spiritually dead. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were many, very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry, dead bones. In other words, what is Ezekiel saying is, there wasn't any flesh on them. There, there wasn't any life there. There were dry, dead bones, right? So that's who we are apart from God. But, listen to what he says here. He says, verse 3, he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? By the way, I think this is a proclamation that we are guilty of, especially when we wrestle through evangelism. We're guilty of listening to the Lord and saying, I know what you say, Lord, but can they really live? Can they, can they really live? Can people really be brought to faith in Christ? It seems like they could, but I mean, can they really be? Because, I don't know, it's hard for me to believe that. And what he says here to Ezekiel, I think, is telling of who we are. And I think even who we must be. He says, Son of man, can these bones live? And I, Ezekiel, said, O Lord God, you know. Who only knows that the dead men's bones can live? Only God. You know, Lord, we don't. I, I, I can't do this. Only you can do that. Only you know. So there's this complete reliance that Ezekiel has on the Lord. Only you know. Only you have that power or authority. And then listen what God says to him. And I think this is really important. And this is why the more we read through this story, the more it's very clear that this is a picture of salvation to come because all the framework that he's given Ezekiel is the same framework that we have for the gospel. So listen to what he says in verse 4 to Ezekiel. Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, what? Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. The word and the truth, or the word of truth, must be proclaimed. Robert took us earlier to uh, Romans chapter 10. We know that God's word must be spoken. God's word must be spoken. Lest we come to Christ. We can't come to Christ without the preaching or the ministering of the word of God. It will not happen. Right? If no one hears the gospel, they cannot be saved. If no one ever hears about Christ, they will not repent and believe. They can't. It's impossible. Because only by the word of God can dead men live. Only by the word of God can these bones be made alive. Only by God's word. 
So you can, we can, we can put as many bumper stickers on in the world as we wanted to. We can put as many billboards as we wanted to about God loving us and God caring for us. And we can give a fraction of the gospel all we want. That will never alone <coughs> save people. That will not save people. We must minister the gospel to people. Now that's part of ministering the gospel to people, right? It is good for us to be hospitable. So when you take a casserole to your neighbor because they're sick... That is showing the love of Christ. That's part of what we're called to do. But is that evangelism? Not to the point of preaching the gospel, right? They're not saved because your casserole was good and your hospitality was good. Right? They're not saved by that. They're only converted by Christ. That's part of it, I think. I think part of it is that we're called to be hospitable. We're called to love on people. We're called to speak of the Lord. Um, Jim Ella, a couple of years ago, said something, and I've tried to do it as much as I can. Because I think it's really practical. He talked about just constantly trying to infuse the Lord into every conversation. Even if it's like you're not going to get to the gospel. You know you're not going to get to the gospel. But just saying, like if somebody asks you how your day's going. And you say, well, the Lord has been kind to me today. You're just constantly pointing people. Even if you're not getting to the gospel. Because you can't get to the gospel practically every single in every single conversation, right? When you go to the gas station and you're late for work and you go by the cashier, you're probably not going to be like, all right, I, got, I have to spend 45 minutes talking about the gospel. Like God opens up doors. Because God is the author of salvation, we'll look into that more in a minute, God opens up doors for those things. But if we're constantly speaking of the Lord and that's constantly on our tongue, well, then when opportunity opens up, then... You know, if we go to the gas station at Tennessee, like, hey, man, how you doing? And instead of saying, yeah, I'm good, man. You, you good? Uh, instead of that, he said, man, I'm really struggling. I'm sorry to tell you that. I don't know who you are, but I'm really struggling. I'm just, my wife just left me and blah, 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 blah. Then that's clear from God that that's an opportunity for you to actually evangelize the gospel. Not to just tell him, man, it's okay. Jesus loves you. Pat on the shoulder and I'm heading out. Now, is that wrong? Well, no. But there's an evangelism that has to take place, right? There has to be the word proclaimed to sinners. Has to be the word proclaimed to sinners. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word. So in this proclamation of the valley of dry bones, God is telling Ezekiel the same thing. Hear, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Speak to these bones. Say, hear what God says. The word of Yahweh. And this is what he does. The Spirit only works salvation through the truth of the gospel. Think about what Hebrews 4.12 says. The word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what, the, that's what the gospel is. It pierces people's hearts. We've all heard testimonies of people being brought to Christ in these absurd ways. Of just somebody preached and it was like it just cut them. And, and it doesn't even make sense. I think Paul Washer's testimony was that he was drunk one night, woke up in a pool of his own vomit, and just remembered the gospel that he had heard many times in his life, preaching in his head and convicting his soul. And I think that's when he said he was saved, actually. He immediately knew, I am wicked. I need God. And all those old things that he had heard, I say old things, the things he had previously heard about the gospel came rushing back into his mind. And there are times we have a, a, a friend, Katie and I have a friend who, her testimony is that she was at a funeral one time and the preacher was just preaching about coming to faith in Christ. And she heard that testimony and just realized, I cannot play around. I'm not a Christian. And she had been a false convert before and said, I need to come to Christ. And it doesn't even make sense sometimes that people come to Christ. But it's the word of the Lord that pierces hearts. And only the word can do that. Not our persuasive speech or our, our ability to be clever or really cool light shows. I know we joke around about that stuff sometimes, but so many churches do that. They drive up emotional concern. Our tears do not equal salvation. Like I grew up, some of you guys grew up in the, in the same time frame I did, and I was like this. I went to church all the time. My parents took me to church all the time. And I went to church camps all the time. Have you ever been to a church camp? Like, man, all those kids would cry every week at church camp. And you get back to school and you remember those kids. And they're back to sleeping with a girlfriend or whatever. It didn't change anything of their life. They cried about it. They were emotional about it. But it did nothing to them. Because they felt guilty and they wanted something to say, hey, it's okay. You're good. You know? 
they wanted somebody to give them encouragement. And people do that all the time, by the way. That's, that's who we are by nature a lot. We have that happen all the time in school. Uh, we have a lot of kids who have bad relationships with their fathers. And so you can tell, especially young ladies, that they're constantly looking for attention, especially from men, because they have these terrible relationships. So when you're encouraging to some of these young ladies, it's like it means everything to them. Because they just want encouragement because they've never had that. And people treat that way, treat God that way sometimes. They say, well, I'm a sinner. I know I've sinned. I've had a wretched life or whatever. But I just want to feel good about myself. It's not really that I want to repent. I just kind of want to feel good about myself. And people will do that. It's not the word of God that has pricked their hearts. It's simply just them wanting to, to have some kind of false assurance. They want to be told that they're okay. That they're not as bad as they think they are. But the word must be preached. And miracles happen when the word is preached. That's why I know uh, Robert and Lee are like this. I know many of our families are like this. We're like this. When we go home, we don't just go home and just do life. We go home and there are times when we, we open the Bible. We read to our kids. Because we know that there is not hope that our kids will look at us and be like, Man, i got to become a Christian. Mom's a Christian. Especially when we're out there throwing fits because of different things. You know, like our stress levels you know, maxed out and everything. They're not looking at us going, man, they're perfect. We need to be like that. It's the conviction from Scripture that preaches that. Now, your testimony surely preaches that, hopefully. But it's the Scripture that preaches to them salvation in Christ. And so we open the Word because it's God's Word into us. Now, verse 4 again. He speaks the Word of the Lord. But what has happened in verse 5? Thus says the Lord God, the Lord Yahweh. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you, that you may come alive. God must breathe life into us. If we're dead in our trespasses and sins... The only way to be made whole is that God breathes life into us. God is the only one, by the way, who is the author of life and death, right? Deuteronomy chapter 32 says that God is the author, essentially saying God is the one who kills and that he's the one who makes alive. Verse 29 of Deuteronomy 32 Well, that's not true. It's 39. He said, See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. I, it is I who put to death, and I who give life. Well, if God is the one who gives physical life, who else would give spiritual life? Only God. Because he is the master, of course, of spiritual life and physical life. So only God is, is master over life and death. Over spiritual life and death. Only God has the keys. We don't have the keys. God is the only one who decides who wakes up and repents and believes the gospel. He's the only one that makes that, that decision. He's the only one. And he has to be the only one. Because we're unable. Remember? We're unable. So if somebody says, tell me about your testament, and you say, well, I came to Christ. You might say that, and we use that language. And that language is in the Bible. Come to Christ, right? But it's only because God has woken us up. It's only because God has done the work. And only, only God's work through Christ can do. Only God's work through Christ will do. This is what Hebrews chapter 12 says. Really, the... <clears throat> preaches Christ Jesus being the author of our faith. It says, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. What does author mean? It means the one who wrote it, right? The one who, the one who created, the one who gave life. It's only by God's desire and God's will that we are saved, or that we are converted, or we are brought to Christ, not our own. The Bible says that it is God's will. Go to John 1 with me. And we'll go to another place in John. So John 1, keep a, keep a finger back in Ezekiel and go to John 1 with me. Verse 
John chapter 1 down to verse 12. John chapter 1 and verse 12. Again, and this is so important to understand as we proclaim the gospel to others as even we think about our own salvation. It's God who wills salvation, not us. It's God who's the one who wakes us up. Listen to verse 12. But focus on verse 13. He says, But as many as received him, for them he gave the right to become children of God. So listen, the language is there. As many as received him. So we say, receive Christ. That's good language to use. It's in the Bible. But notice he says the driving force behind us receiving Christ. He says, even to those who believe in his name, verse 13, who were born. So this is kind of that new birth aspect that he's going to talk about in John 3. He says, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but what? But of God. This is not our will who saves sinners. We are not saved by our own will. We have not tired our bootstraps tight enough, right? That old picture, I mean, we love that in American culture. Hey, tie those bootstraps on. Let's go. Pick yourself up. And we love stories like that. And I don't think that's okay. I mean, like, God calls us to be responsible. He absolutely does. But he is the author of all blessing. Everything that we have is from him. And salvation is completely, completely of God. We are not saved by our will. God changes our will. And it's by his will that we are brought to Christ, not ours. So God, it's his desire, his breathing life into us. Think about what I mentioned out of Ezekiel 36. And we'll look at that more next week, Ezekiel 36. But Ezekiel is prophesying again to the people of Israel. He says, I want to take out your heart. I want to put a new heart and a new spirit within you. And the picture is for the immediate impact, of course, is the Israelite people. But really, the bigger picture is that we can't be made new in ourselves, and we need someone to come, and it's pointing to the new covenant. It's pointing to the relationship that we have in Christ, that the Spirit himself must work in us. Think about John chapter 3. John chapter 3, when Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born again, you remember that story. John or uh, Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born again. But notice what Jesus also says. He says, you must be born again. But then he says, verse 8 or verse 7, he says, do not be amazed. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, Nicodemus rightly, I think, would, would have a few questions. He's trying to understand what it means to be born again, I'm sure. But on the other hand, how can a man decide to be born again? Did you have any control over your first birth? Did you get to decide that you got to be a Lee or a Goodman or a Willett? No, because, I mean, practically speaking, you probably wouldn't have chosen those families, right? You could have chosen a lot richer, funner, cooler people. I don't know. But you didn't. You didn't get to decide that. You didn't get to decide that you were born in the richest nation in the world in the most blessed country in existence. You didn't get to decide that. You didn't get to decide that you were born in a pagan family who, who would abuse you, or in a foreign family that, that had other gods that they worshipped. You didn't get to decide that. You don't get to decide, get to decide this birth either. It's a new birth. But then what Jesus says at the end is a phrase that we often leave off when we preach this message. People preach this all the time. Verse 8, though, <coughs> verse 7, he says, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Verse 8, he kind of, he kind of ties this on to the end. But it's not a side note. It's very important. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Life in Christ comes in the Spirit. The Spirit does the work. And we can't wield the Spirit. We can't make the Spirit show up. We can't make the Spirit save. We can't decide that the Spirit will come in. Right? This is a person. The person. When we talk about the Spirit of God, it's a part of the person of God. Right? It, it's God in Spirit. So we don't tell the Spirit what to do. Do we tell the Father what to do? Father, bless me now. I demand it. We don't do that because God is God. We don't tell Jesus, Jesus, you're going to do this right now. That would be so arrogant of us and foolish, right? God could just destroy us. But he doesn't. 
So the Spirit, we can't treat the Spirit like that either. Well, the Spirit will just do what I tell Him. No. The Spirit does what He wishes. And in that passage, Jesus said that the wind blows where it wishes. Where it comes from and where it is going, you do not know of. So it is with the Spirit of God. We don't get to control the Spirit of God. Like many of you in your life, you were saved. And if you looked at your life, you're like, how in the world was I saved? I was listening to a clip from a Vody Bauckham sermon, and he talks about going back to Compton in Los Angeles and preaching the funeral of his father. His father died at like 50-something years old. And he said he was just crying after the funeral. He just had to go and remove himself after the funeral and just cry and cry because he was like, how in the world did I, did I make it out of this? How in the world did God save me from this? He didn't just wake up one day and said, I want to be a Christian. His mom was a Buddhist. But yet God reached down by his will, by his spirit, decided, I'm saving him. I'm going to wake him up. I'm going to bring him into salvation in Christ. And Vody Bauckham talks about just weeping over that fact that, that he had nothing, that he should be on the way to hell. Yet God rescued him from that life. He said he went back to that area. Many people that he knew were dead or in jail in gangs or, or whatever, violent men, but God saved him. That's the grace of God. And that's, that's the spirit of God that works that we cannot wield. So, this salvation, this salvation is of God. Go back to Ezekiel 37. So he says, I want to put, you're going to preach the word of the Lord. And then verse 5 says, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. This is what he's saying to the bones. But then, at the end of verse 6, he says, I will come, cover you with skin, and put breath in you that you may come alive. There's a proclamation of the gospel. Then what? What's the next line? That you will know that I am the Lord. Salvation is of God. All, all of salvation is is all of God and all for God. Listen. Hey. Listen. All of salvation is all of God and all for God. We are completely dependent upon God to work. We read that in Ephesians 2. And if you remember, in Ephesians 2, after Paul made the proclamation in verses 1 through 3 that we're dead in our trespasses and sins, we get down to verse 8, and what does he say? He doesn't just say, well, you know, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, so there's no hope. No, in verse 8 he says, for by grace you have been, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, but what? It's a gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We're completely dependent upon God to work. And this is for God's glory. Again, you're not saved just where you'll have assurance so that you can live a great life in America and then die and go to heaven and live an even better life in heaven. <clears throat> you're saved for God. You're saved for Him, His glory, for God Himself, for Christ Jesus in the name of Christ. We're saved for Him. We're saved for Him. As a conclusion, I'll say this. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is why we plead with God to save. Because we can't. This is why we cry out to God. This is why we pray to God for your children, for your neighbors, for your parents, for your friends. This is why we pray. Because we know only God can save sinners. So we must put our full hope in Christ and His ability to save. We must trust in the work of the Spirit. We must trust in the work of the Spirit. We don't seek to grow some religion or grow some church just because we make or we can get people to agree with us in principle. We want God to do the work because only He can. And that's what must happen. There must be a supernatural work wrought by God Himself. And that's all that can happen. So that's what we put our faith in and our trust in that God will save sinners. So weep, cry, plead with the Lord. 
to rescue the perishing and save the dying. Plead. Because that is our only hope. That is our city's only hope is that God will stir. We cannot be a people who just puts it on the side that we're going to have revival. We must have God do that. And that actually gives so much encouragement to me as a preacher that it's not dependent upon me to save sinners. I can't make you do anything. I can plead for the rest of my life until I die yelling about the gospel. But that will not do anything. Only God can rescue. Only God can bring new life and to give life into dead bones. So that means we must be a pleading people that God would do that. That God would rescue. That God would save. In salvation, it is of God. In salvation, men are brought to faith in Christ. It must be God calling out to them. It must be God making that proclamation. We can preach to a thousand people at one time. And unless God quickens their spirit, unless God works in them, it's just falling on deaf ears. So we plead. We plead with the Lord to work. And so as we prayed for in our prayer time this morning, plead with the, with the Lord that He will work. Plead that He will rescue sinners. We must. Because if He doesn't, there's no hope for us. There's no hope for the lost and the dying and the perishing around the world. Um, I'll close with this. Paul, uh, Charles Spurgeon has this quote. And I know I'm going to mess it up because I didn't write it down. But he says something like this. If, if men are headed to hell, let us or let them have to leap over our bodies as we, as we just plead with them and preach to them the gospel. Let that be the case. Plead with them, but more importantly, plead with God that he would work, that he would save. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are gracious, that you are kind, that you are merciful to us, and that you do save sinners, that you do rescue the perishing and the lost and the dying. Help us realize that it's by your will that men are saved, not by our own. And that we must have you work and that your spirit must work to change men. So please do so, God. Please do so in our church and sanctify us in Christ. Not only is it impossible for us to come to Christ on our own, it's impossible for us, Lord, to even be sanctified on our own. So we need you. We need you to work in us to bring us into a closer relationship with you. We need you to work to make us more and more like Christ. So please, God, work in Christ's fellowship that our people would be growing in Christ, that we would be drawing near to you, God, please. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Ephesians chapter 2, he says this starting in verse 4. He says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Amen. Amen. Amen.